Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking to his disciples, giving them the laws, so to speak, of his kingdom, how we're to conduct ourselves as citizens of his kingdom in this world. So he delivers this sermon to his disciples, but his eyes are on the multitudes. We're all part of those multitudes. Maybe some of you still are tonight. The Lord wants to save you tonight and bring you into his kingdom. And so Jesus speaking says in verse 13, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Early on in my Christian life, I would hear people tell me, whether in sermon form or some other form, that I was the salt of the earth and that I was the light of the world. (laughs) Really. And I knew that that's what I was biblically. I knew that that's what the Lord said about me. But the question that would always rise in my mind is, how in the world am I that? And so, you know, I, I, am, I am a Pharisee at heart. I will readily confess it to you. If I had been born again into a legalistic system, I would have run until I dropped dead. So I am. I've got a little, I think I can train inside of me that's bigger than the one at Disneyland. <laughs> and so I try to figure out, okay... I'm the salt to the, you know, the earth. I'm the light of the world. And, and uh, so, okay, I'm just, I'm going to be salty. I'm going to be, and, and, I, and I'd always ask myself, well, how in the world can I be that? And then it dawned on me that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world as the Beatitudes characterize our lives. As our lives by the Holy Spirit, as we talked about last time, <laughs> are characterized by these Beatitudes, poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, these things, those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And as I live by the person of the Holy Spirit, this kind of life, and he gives me the will to do and the power to do, then all of a sudden my life becomes distinctive from everything in this world. When's the last time you saw a commercial that elevated those virtues? Or saw a television show that did? Or the previews for some sitcom that did? And when the Lord produces these things in our lives as his disciples... It makes us distinctive. And it makes us distinctive in a way that looks like Jesus. There's a great deal of talk about holiness and the need to be holy. And holy is one of those words that you can really say good, you know, that kind of thing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful word. But we should always and forever run our definitions of holiness through the person of the Lord Jesus. He is the Holy One. And true holiness that the Spirit of God is working in our lives will always look like the Lord Jesus. And of course, these Beatitudes encapsulate Him perfectly. And so as my life is characterized by the Beatitudes, my life becomes distinctive. And thus, as a Christian, my life becomes influential in this world. We can never reach this world by being like this world. This is a great mistake that many are making today. I don't know what condition you were in by the time you came to know the Lord. I did not want a Christianized version of what I was in. Thank you very much. I was smarter than that, and I wouldn't have given five minutes to it. 
And this idea that Christ came to make good men better, rather than the truth of the matter, as the old saying goes, that he came to make dead men alive. That's what I was looking for. I was a dead man dead in my sins. I wanted someone who would raise me up out of that. And so he comes in and by his spirit he makes us a different kind of people. And because he does that now, we are the salt of the earth. And as we live in line with those beatitudes and God works them into our lives, then it makes us salty. We talk about salt today and you see the salt of the earth and say, is that bad for blood pressure? What I mean, what is this? <laughs> you know, and kind of, you know, we use salt as a seasoning for the most part. But in that culture, that was not what salt was used for supremely, though it was used for that. Salt was used in that ancient world to preserve, to um, hinder corruption. And so he's speaking to what, a, a group he's on the Sea of Galilee. You've got a bunch of fishermen there in the audience. And they knew that when they caught those fish in the Sea of Galilee and they could get the best price that they could get for them down in Jerusalem, that they couldn't get them walking them down to Jerusalem before they'd rot on the way and be good for nothing. And so what would they do? They'd take and they'd fillet them and they would salt them and then take them to Jerusalem. Because they knew in that day, just like we know in this day, that salt, uh, it, it hinders the spread of corruption. It is a preservative. And just as those fishermen would take that salt and apply it to those fish in order to resist that tendency towards corruption that would occur if nothing was done at all, the Lord takes His people, that is us, and He applies us to this earth in order that we might hinder the spread, or at least slow it down, of corruption in this world. And so, if salt wasn't put on the meat, it would putrefy. And if God did not put his people in this world, this world would be one rotten place. You know, it's fascinating to me. And, and some, if you don't know the Lord yet, you may say, well, that's a pretty haughty thing to say, you know. Well, I'm full of haughtiness tonight, so stick with me. <laughs> As time goes on, Christians, those that will stick with the Word of God, being blamed for everything. Boy, if they could just get rid of you. What this world doesn't know is that one day they will be rid of us. And that's when a literal hell breaks loose on this earth called the Great Tribulation. For all of the complaints that are made against the body of Christ for the things that we stop and they vote down this and they won't call this sin lawful and they won't this and they won't just roll over and all of that. They're in the way of all of our progress. Don't they understand that the United States is heading the way of Europe? It's inevitable. And look at Europe. Let's just cut to the chase. And they don't know that one day the body of Christ is going to be removed from this earth and then that influence there by the Holy Spirit inside of us is going to be removed and this er world is going to turn into a, a mess beyond what people can imagine. So salt, it hinders the spread of corruption. And I think it's important that we understand that God's going to do that through our lives. And we're going to get to it in a moment where he just says, let your light so shine, just let. You don't have to get and say, okay, what wattage can I be today, you know, or how salty can I make myself? It's nothing like that. It's just walk with the Lord, obey the Lord, love the Lord, stay close to the Lord, abide in the Lord, enjoy that personal relationship, and we're going to be plenty salty. We're going to be plenty salty. In, in this world. But we're here to hinder the spread of corruption. It was interesting to me that in the uh, recent uh, Prop 22 campaign, as it related to protecting the institution of marriage, or, or whatever the kind of definition you might put upon it, and I, of course, read all of the things concerning the issue in the letters to the editor. I love the letters to the editor. The ones I hate, I still love them to read them. And, and, and uh, 
I used to watch Crossfire and all of those shows, you know, with a remote in my hand. I jumped from one to the other. I can argue with several channels all at the same time. <laughs> it's a tremendous gift I have. But it was interesting to read what some of the Christians were saying as it related to that whole, the whole homosexual side. And essentially everyone knows that it's, it's an attempt, was an attempt to stop this infiltration and movement of homosexuality as it relates to, to taking over the institution of, of marriage. And it was the only way that, that, that uh, could, they could have it come about that way. But there were a lot of people that looked in and they said, uh, listen, um, we're not, uh, we're all for, and these are Christians, all for, you know, the homosexuals having a, um, uh, some kind of legal, you know, definition as it relates to blessing in a, in a legal way, their union and that kind of thing, but just stay away from the institution of marriage. That's not resisting corruption. And it's not what we're called to do. We're not called to harm people. We're not called to physically hurt people. But we are called to call right, right, and to call wrong, wrong. And how many within the society, you can take illustrations from homosexuality, you can take illustrations from people living together and that kind of thing. I mean, who even, apart from the body of Christ, and uh, it has a concern over that at all anymore? Telling the truth anymore. <laughs> This becomes is the only thing that we're doing is here we are being salt and resisting a, a trend that if, if we weren't there to resist it, it would just go crazy. But there's a great tendency to be afraid to resist corruption and, and its movement. And it is the loving thing to do to resist corruption. The homosexual community in the United States of America today the life expectancy for a man in the United States of America today is 74 years of age. The life expectancy for a homosexual man in the United States of America is 40 years of age. That's without AIDS. Put AIDS in the factor and it comes down to 38 years. You have a lifestyle and a sin style that is carving off, on average, 35-plus years of life from individual human beings. And it is the loving thing to make a stand and say it is not right to do that. This is sin. It is unnatural for a man to have sex with another man. There is something wrong with that. And everybody's concerned. Everybody has their own opinion. But God, can't God have his own opinion? And he comes in and God says, that is something that's sin. It's unacceptable to him. Because it robs people of the life that he has for them. That's sin among many other sins that can hold us in bondage before we come to know the Lord. And it takes all of the love we have to stand in and look the people in that camp, in the eye, in this world, say, I'm not going to throw anything at you. I'm not going to do anything physically to you. But I'm not going to let you redefine this as right. Because God has called me here to be an influence against the spread of corruption. And the fact of the matter is, some of them may turn. As it, and will doubtless turn. And, and, and again, this is, you know, this is the hot, hot sin of right now that's being batted around and trying to gain legitimacy, and so many others have already. But we still are called to resist. Resist corruption. The interesting thing about salt is it also creates a thirst. The movie theaters have discovered this related to their popcorn. I went to... Uh, a Golden State Warrior basketball game a couple nights ago. Boy, they're terrible. But anyway, <laughs> got to build that team from the ground up. They don't have one franchise player on that team. But anyway, listen, that's nowhere to be found in this passage. I just wanted to have some popcorn and I wanted to have a soda, some pop. So I went over here and you got to get the popcorn over here for, um, you know, 
$4.50 for a small. And then you go over here and you have to go over here to get a Coke. And, uh, and a small Coke is $187 because they salt the popcorn over here in order to get you to buy. But what was interesting, I was standing there and uh, the very close personal friend that I was with was in line there. And I said, I gave him the money and I said, why don't you, you know, get me a, a, a soda here. And, that, and I looked up on the thing and, you know, when I was a kid... You know, they would have a small, they would have a medium, they would have a large, they'd have an extra large, and, and then and now, of course, they have a four-gallon and all of these things. On the thing. but, but it was interesting. I was looking up there because I was going to see if I was going to get a small or a medium. And the fascinating thing is there was no small. They started at medium. They started, you can't even get a small now. You've got to get a medium because they're afraid that a small, no one would buy a small. So they start to call medium the smallest, the small, the smallest one on the menu has to be a small. Don't be telling me medium. <laughs> so anyway, so salt does create, uh, create a thirst. And um, the interesting thing is that he doesn't say that we give salt. He doesn't say that we have salt. He says that we are salt. And the you are is emphatic. It carries with it the idea of you and you alone are the salt of the earth. Again, that may sound haughty to some. But Jesus is saying you and you alone are the salt of the earth. There is no backup plan. There is no plan B. If you fail to take it seriously, there isn't another group that I come in and they do kind of mostly about what you would have done. There's nothing else on the drawing board. There's nothing else that's going to be called. We will either be the salt of the earth or there will be no salt. Hmm. No one else has the capacity, the capability of being the salt of the earth. If we're not that influence in this world then uh, no one is going to uh, have that influence in this world. You know, that whole thing where uh, the salt and the creation of thirst. Uh, when, when I was a kid, I'll, I'll tell you, I can, I can tell you by name and by memory the Christians who lived this kind of a life. And I'll tell you, they were salty for me. They created a real thirst for me for real things and true things. And how many of us here tonight, don't shout out, but uh, are Christians here tonight because of some Christian who lived that life before us and created a thirst within us? Another thing that salt does is that it brings healing. And in order for it to bring healing, it has to sting a little bit. You know, one of the greatest things for a sore throat is to gargle with salt water, isn't it? <laughs> so what, uh, now they have all of the different medicines, but I mean, before they had that, well, there was one of one of your children came to me after third service. I won't say what your name is. I'll try not to spill it, the beans here. But he came up to me, and he's got this little styrofoam cup, and he's got one of those stir sticks, and he has some kind of a pink drink in there. And I know we're not serving any kind of pink drinks here on the on the Sunday mornings. I said, what you got there? He says, I grabbed one of those Robitussin cough drops and I put it here in the water and I've been stirring it all service long to turn it into this. He said, would you like a drink? I said, no, I'm not really interested in that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but now they have all these other things, but you know, salt used to do that. Sometimes when I was a kid, um, and I had a twin brother, and, and, uh, but once in a while, you know, you'd go and you'd be so hungry, and you bite down on something, and you bite inside your mouth, you know. A big old chunk comes off, and you, is that my cheek, or is that what I'm eating? Ah! Just blood all over the place. And then, and then of course, you get, it gets, it, it, the mouth is such a, it's the dirtiest part of the body. And, uh, and so it can get infected or whatever. One of the things we do is we just take a little bit of salt and we put it, you know, on where we bit our lip or whatever it likes. And, you, and we do it in the mirror. You put it like, like this. And then all of a sudden it hit, you know. And I mean, our mouths let it get a water all down the side and tears coming down and everything. But I'll tell you something, a couple of days it was all gone. It was all gone. Listen. We help you with medical advice. We do a lot of things here at this, at this church for you. 
It stings when you put it on something rotten, but, but it brings healing to it. Salt adds flavor, doesn't it? It adds flavor to food. And Christians are too, and I think we do. We add a flavor to life. And I think we're made for the fight. If we weren't involved in a warfare, I mean, was, I mean, when it's done and it's time to get out and get new bodies, I mean, in this even fallen as Christians, I think we need to be in the fight. We need to be in the mix to stay healthy, really. They had a years and years ago. They were taking, um, uh, I think it was cod fish for you know the fish and chips thing, and they they were taking it and transporting it across country in order to do fish and chips with them. And uh, so they'd catch these fish, and they'd kill these fish, and they'd put them in this, you know, tanker of water and then run them across the country. And by the time they got there, you know, in order to to, uh, make the fish and chips out of them, they were ghastly. They're terrible to eat. Nobody would eat them. So what they discovered is they take these tankers, fill them up with water, and they put the live fish in them and let them swim the whole trip over there and then kill them. They'd swim in the whole thing, but they'd, they'd stay fit. They'd stay good. They'd stay, and I, and I think in this whole battle that we're in the middle of, there's something about the battle that we, we need. It keeps us fit. It keeps us, it keeps us healthy. But our lives, it, it adds flavor uh, to, to life and to society. Interesting thing about salt in ancient times is it was extraordinarily valuable. Wars were fought over salt. Not over the nations. They fought over the salt, the salt trade routes, the source of salt. Some of the greatest cities in Europe today that people spend gazillions of dollars to go into tour were built off of salt money because you have to have salt to live. Nothing can live without salt. Salzburg, named after salt there in Austria, the most beautiful cities in Europe and uh, part of that whole salt trade. Jesus says, that we are the salt of the earth. We have all of these kinds of influences as we live the life, abiding life with him that he's called us to. And as I said before, nothing and no one can be the salt of the earth we're at. Now you notice the danger that he speaks of as it relates to the, to the salt in verse 13. The danger is that we lose our flavor, that we would lose our distinctiveness from everything else in the world. If we become like everything else in the world, I'll tell you, we've ceased to be all of those good things that salt is. My life loses its sting. When's the last time my life stung another life? Say, no, that's wrong. That's not right. Uh, That's not right. God says that's wrong. Mm -mm. That's right. And we're getting increasingly afraid to be different and to be distinctive and uh, doesn't mean that we're going to be obnoxious to people or anything like that but we make a stand here in this society that God has put us in and so if we lose our distinctiveness if we lose our saltiness our sting our Christ likeness then you notice what he says there we become good for nothing except to be thrown out on the paths trampled under the feet of men that's what they would do when salt would lose its savor and it would take quite a bit for salt to lose its savor but once it had done that it really was good for nothing nobody wanted it it was valueless so they would just take and throw it on the pass and it would just burn away the weeds and everything and, uh, and then people would walk all over it and that was a, this was something a, a picture in their mind that they understood uh, very very clearly if I as a Christian lose my distinctiveness if I lose my saltiness I am good for nothing Oh, sure, I can eat three meals a day and, you know, eat my share of whatever in the world. I can stay alive. I can do all of these different things. I can exist. I can take up my space on planet Earth. But in terms of the kingdom of God and making a difference for the kingdom of God, I have, am, have, am good for absolutely uh, nothing in this world. And I think it's good for us just to let that sink in because there's so much pressure today against us being different in this world. And we must stay different from this world. Otherwise, we're going to end up trampled. We're going to end up trampled. So the Lord speaks to us tonight as his disciples, like he did 2,000 years, and he says, Don't lose your saltiness. 
for the sake of the multitudes who are yet to become my people. And then you notice in verse 14, he begins to speak in these three verses, next three verses, about the image of light. And he calls us the light of the world. What does that mean? It means that apart from us, this world is in darkness. And we are the light of the world only because we are indwelt by the person of the Holy, uh, of the Holy Spirit, really the person of Jesus by the Spirit. And so we are thus the light of the world. Jesus was the light of the world, designated himself as the light of the world. He said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And in his physical absence from this world, by his Holy Spirit coming inside of us, we now become the light of the world, a light for him in this dark world. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and he said, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, who among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And again, it's the same thing. You are the singular light of the world. If we will not be the light of the world, then there are no other lights. Again, there is no uh, backup plan. And it's a tremendous privilege to be the light of the world. It's also a tremendous responsibility. Then in verse 14, he tells us that we're, he uses the example of a city set upon a hill. He said, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, you go to Jerusalem, if you go uh, to Israel and you go to the Mount of Beatitudes, and there's this beautiful mountain and an area that could very well be the place where Jesus gave his sermon on the mount. And you look off in the distance, and there's a city on a hill. And the city's name is Safed. And at nighttime, when the lights go down, there is Safed. You see it in the distance. No one can miss that city because it's lit at night and it's on the top of, of that hill. And so he's probably doing what he did continually. He's using illustrations that they all understood uh, from the geographical area that they were in. And the fact of the matter is that this kind of life can never be hid. You can't hide that kind of a life. It's very different in, this, in, in the world and then he talks in verse 15 about the example of an oil lamp. I think they use candles in some of the versions, but I don't like that because I like the image of the oil because, of course, uh, the, the person of the Holy Spirit and all of the typology on that. So he talks about an oil lamp in the house. And the reason that you light an oil lamp, you know, now we, we, turn, on, uh, we turn on electrical lights and uh, sometimes electricity is so cheap and uh, people turn all the lights on in the house. Nobody ever turns the lights out or anything like that. And so they're paying these enormous bills that they don't need to. Uh, our dad used to always say, turn the light on. Who didn't turn the light on in here? Come in, get up. I don't care what you're watching. Get over here and turn that light up. And you had him and you turn the light on. And then pretty soon you learn to turn the light off. But he didn't want to pay more money for than he had to on, on the thing. He was paying the bills. So we wanted to eat. And so we would do it. But you, turn, you light a lamp, and, and oil was expensive in those days. No one would light it just to have it sitting there. You would light it for a purpose that it would give light into the house. There's a purpose. So God has put the Holy Spirit inside of us, the oil inside of us, in order that our lives might light the world that we are in. And one of the things about light is it does expose, and this is a troubling thing for people about light. Interesting thing about light is it has absolute authority over darkness. <laughs> dark can never win against the light. Interesting thing, you give a, a dark room, you say, all right, I don't like that dark room. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat that darkness right out of there. You pick up a bat, go in there, swing around for a few minutes and everything, clear everything out, and you see bat around and everything. You leave that room, it's as dark as ever. How do you get rid of darkness? You walk in there, you turn on that light switch, you say, where did the darkness go? Just go. So it's subservient to light. And so darkness always has, has to give way to light. And so here we are, we're the light of the world, and when we come into certain situations, our lives, because we are light, is going to expose some of the evils that get hidden in the darkness. And a lot of times there's a lot of persecution because of that. 
You go into a situation where sin's going on, you come in and say, hey, listen, that's not right, you shouldn't be doing that, or whatever it might be, or you just show up. Oh, look who showed up, Pat Boone. Oh, look at the little Christian kid. I mean, you just show up and all of a sudden everybody's all bunk. Oh, no, not them. Not when we're doing this. Get out of here. You know, and, and it, because there's immediately that conviction. Tell them the, uh, the, the, the pizza. Do we have a phone over here? I think. Okay, yeah. They call. He's going to order the pizza. I said seven. I didn't know what the thing was, just to make sure. And, and, yeah. The interesting thing is that Jesus was the light of the world, and the world wasn't that excited about his light, and they ended up crucifying him in order to put that light out. And we're like our master. It's going to happen to us. And so an absence of persecution sometimes. We don't have to go out and look for persecution. I want someone to hammer on me today or something like that and and get in their face. But persecution will come just as we live as a light. Now the danger, just like with the salt, the danger related to the light, is in, in verse 14 and 15, is that if we lose our distinctiveness, if we hide the light, if we hide the light because of fear, hide the light because of compromise or whatever it might be, or one thing in one group or another thing in another group, this kind of thing, the light of God in our life should shine out the same in all the circumstances that we find ourselves in. There's a true story that uh, uh, Dr. Fullerton uh, shares related to a lighthouse in Florida where a storm had come in, a hurricane force, and hit the lighthouse. These things are built to to withstand these uh, enormous winds. And uh, the storm was so great, the hurricane was so great, that it blew one of the windows out in the hurricane. So there's a series of windows all the way around. They had no ability to replace that window uh, on uh, on kind of a short order of, of things. And uh, so what they did is they got a piece of metal and they got it up into place and, and all in order to ride out the storm. And then during the course of the night, there was a boat that was coming in and it, and it brought itself right on into the land and uh, great damage to itself because it was coming in on the one side of the lighthouse that had been darkened. And, and so what, what happens is you can't in one environment be one thing and another environment be something else. But that light's going out of our lives, all of the environments that we're in. So everyone can have an opportunity uh, to stay away from what will wreck their light. And so he tells us that we need to be careful not to hide our light for the sake of the multitude. You notice in verse 16 that our light shines through good works. We just do good works, and, and Christians are to be known for good works. I think we, I, I really think we, we fall short of that today. I think, uh, I, I think that a lot of people do a lot of good things, but I mean for the body of Christ overall, where someone just thinks about a Christian and goes, "Listen, don't rip on them. I've seen them do too much for you to start to hammer them." Well, there was a time they came and they helped my little aunt here and this thing here and this and here and this and all of that. And, and it's, it's good for us to be known for that as Christians. Good works in our lives. And then he says that those good works are to be done in such a way that they bring glory to our Heavenly Father. But they look at our lives and say the quality of good works and the number of good works makes them realize this is supernatural. This is not a normal human being. Something else is inside of them doing this. And all of a sudden, they realize that it's the Lord inside of our life, and he receives the glory. Of course, Jesus continually in his ministry, he would do his good works, and the response of the multitudes was they glorified his Father who was in heaven. He had an amazing way of doing things that turned all of the focus uh, to the Lord. And so he tells us there, and I love it in verse 16, it's been helpful to me over the years, that first word of verse 16, let. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That takes a lot of pressure off of me as a, uh, a retired and uh, potentially future Pharisee. As I just, I just, I'll tell you, you want light, I'll give you light, Lord. Oh, man, I'll give you light. You want salt, I'll tell you, I'll be the most obnoxious person. You know, and and, uh, and mi- misunderstand all of the things that, 
that he's saying there. But I mean, I would, I'd run to death in order to be what the Lord, you know, wants me to be. And here's he uses this word let. There's no striving, no pressure. Just let this happen in my life as I walk with the Lord. Someone says, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Hey, what do you think about this? Do you think this is right or do you think this is wrong? That's clearly wrong. Oh, no, that's clearly right. You're on firm ground there with that. And we just can walk in there openly with the Lord. And all of a sudden, people are understanding what it is that we're about. Now, it's interesting that in using the the symbols of light and and using uh, the symbol of salt, the Lord is communicating that this world is both corrupt and it's dark. And it is. It is. It's heartbreaking. And I don't know just... What it is, um, you walk around in our beautiful city, in our cities like really the rest of the world, and you see how dark the world is and how corrupt it is. You just watch people. It's a fascinating thing to do, to watch people, to watch the choices that they're making to observe the bondages that they are in. Like we were talking this morning, sin like food in the United States is so cheap. There's a million things to get addicted to here. And you just begin to watch the casualties. You watch the the people and what... You know, wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is justified by the kind of person that it produces. And you watch what this world is producing, the kind of person. And it's heartbreaking. This world is dark. And this world is very, very corrupt. And what it needs, though it will never tell us, we're going to have to take the Lord's word for it, what it needs is, it needs salt and light. It doesn't need dimmer switches. It doesn't need anything like that. It needs... Christians to live as salt and life. And so he lists the characteristics that are to characterize our lives and the Beatitudes. These are to be the attitudes that are in our lives. And as that is our character, then this will be our influence in the culture that we're in. An influence like salt and light. And so I think it's good for us. No condemnation. I can condemn. I really can. I'm I'm masterful at, at the use of guilt and condemnation. I've kind of retired from that a little bit, though, but I keep it in my back pocket just in case I need it any time. In case we hit a dead spot on the sermon, you know. Can pull it out, liven things up. But I think it's good for us as Christians here tonight. The worship team's going to come up in just a moment, and they're going to lead us in worship. And just to ask, now, is my life really salty? Does my my witness just get walked on all the time? Is my life a light? Is my life different from this world that I'm living in? That's God's intent for our lives. That's His standard for our lives. And tonight's an opportunity just to freshly surrender to that standard. Freshly ask for the filling of His Holy Spirit if that's what needs to happen in my life. I think of all those people who lived it lived the Christian life in the high school that I attended. There weren't that many, but there were a few. I remember them. I think of people who lived it in my adult life. I think of Christians that really lived the life of Christ and loved every minute of it, even after I became a Christian. The beauty of that life, just being salt and the wonderful ways that salt is, just being light and what it has done, so attractive to me. It just doesn't make me say, oh boy, I've got to do this or oh, I've got to be this. Just look, I just look at it and I think, I want to be that way because of the influence and the impact that those lives had upon me. If I could have in some small way that same impact upon others, and the Lord will do it. He'll come upon us tonight by His Holy Spirit if we reach out to Him tonight.